My name is Hoda Mahmoudi, and I'm the holder of the Baha'i Chair. Tonight, I am also happy to announce that this year marks the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. So for us, it's a celebration. I would like to begin by thanking, uh, as you notice, the marvelous, talented group of musicians who have kindly and capably provided the suitable prelude to our program. Please joining, join me in thanking them. I would also like to bring to your attention that we have um, what we call the BSOS ambassadors, BSOS standing for the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, who are volunteers that assist with these sorts of events. They plan, they coordinate, and they uh, execute these special events in a very orderly, wonderful fashion, and we're grateful to them for helping us tonight. Of course, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our honored speaker, Professor Sharon Halevi, who has traveled far to be here with us tonight. If you would please stand. There are a number of other distinguished guests here tonight, and I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge them because their work is extremely important to the work of the Baha'i Chair. And it's my personal pleasure and deep gratitude to introduce to you the members of the newly formed International Advisory Board for the Baha'i Chair. And as I call off their names, I would like them to stand, remain standing, they're gonna hate me for this, remain standing, <laughs> uh, and I would like you to please hold your applause until I have finished calling on all the names. First, Professor John Townsend, Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Mr. Kenneth Bowers, Member and Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. Ms. Ann Holmes, Assistant Dean for Administration and Finance College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Dr. Janet Kahn, independent scholar. Mrs. Mojgan Laroy Patel, architect and real estate broker. Dr. Ross Lewin could not be here with us tonight, but he is the Associate Vice President for International Affairs at the University of Maryland. Mr. Louis Maani, President Babbage Zimmel. Mr. Julian McQueen, founder and CEO, Innisfree Hotels, and his wife, Mrs. Kim McQueen, who although not officially a member of the advisory board, <laughs> does enormous work to support the board. Mrs. Fariba Mahjour, community leader. Mr. Maziar Sabet, chief advancement officer, Hong Kong International School. Mr. Vafa Valapur, co-founder and principal, United World Infrastructure, and Dr. Paul Huth, director and professor for the Center of International Development and Conflict Management. He is in Geneva in a very difficult, hard assignment this semester on sabbatical, and he couldn't be here with us tonight. These are the members of the board of director, uh, advisory board of the Baha'i Chair. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Another very special guest tonight is Ms. Bani Dugal. If you would please stand. She is the principal representative of the Baha'i International Community to the United Nations. The Baha'i International Community is an international non-governmental organization with affiliates 
in over 180 countries, which together represent over 5 million members of the Baha'i Faith. We are very happy to have you here tonight. I would like to acknowledge Mrs. Joanna Conrad, who is the member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. I would like to recognize my distinguished colleague and the first holder of the Baha'i Chair, Professor Emeritus Sohail Bouchouri. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, one area of significant work that the Baha'i Chair is involved in and is under the mission of the Baha'i Chair is research and publication on the most pressing issues related to global peace and our understanding of how to make the world a better place. This academic year, the Baha'i Chair is pleased to be hosting two international visiting scholars from China who are carrying out such research. By the end of this academic year, their work will culminate in the publication of two books that will explore values and education in building a peaceful culture. It is my pleasure to ask Professor Zhu Hong to stand. And Professor Zhang Jing. Also in the audience is uh, another holder of a peace chair. There are three peace chairs at the University of Maryland. And that is my, my very distinguished colleague, Professor Shibli Telhami. Yes. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Dean John Townsend, who I would like to say a few words about, which I know he doesn't want me to, but I'd like to. Um, you know, he is uh, the dean of the largest college at the University of Maryland. And I won't go into the statistics, but it's quite impressive uh, what a large, um, as he calls it, is almost like a medium-sized university, which he leads and, and does so superbly. His distinguished leadership continues to strengthen the college. And under his strong leadership, um, it, the college has really achieved the highest level of academic standards within a very vibrant intellectual milieu. A short list of some of the dean's ongoing accomplishments for the college include his promotion of interdisciplinary education and research. He is responsible for recruiting one third of the college's faculty who represent the highest scholarship. And he has significantly advanced the areas of computing and technology. Dean Townsend has been a strong supporter of the three peace chairs at the University of Maryland. These include the Sadat Chair for World Peace, the George and Lisa Zahem Khalil Gibran Chair for Values and Peace, and the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. It was the Dean's vision to have the three peace chairs at this university reside in the same building, in a, and the building is called Chincoteague Hall, uh, and it's very nice because we're all neighbors, so we get to visit each other often. On a personal note, I wish to thank Dean Townsend for his continuous and exceptional support of the Baha'i Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Professor John Townsend. Well, th thank you very much for those very kind remarks. Uh, uh, on behalf of the University of Maryland and the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, I offer you a very warm welcome to the 2013 Annual Lecture of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. 
The university and the college are extremely grateful that the Baha'i community is represented here tonight by Mr. Kenneth Bowers, a distinguished member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. I especially would like to acknowledge and thank Mr. Bowers for the sustained, generous support provided by the chair, to the chair by the National Spiritual Assembly. Thank you so much. I can speak to the college when I say that the important work of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace gives emphasis to the core mission of my college, namely to identify viable solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. The Baha'i Chair's three-pronged mandate, education, publication and research, resonates with the college's overall mission. The faculty, staff and students of the college act on this mission every day through our research, our partnership, our teaching, our commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship, and our active engagement with the wider world. The College of Behavioral and Social Sciences considers the mission of the Baha'i Chair vital to this university. We aspire to excellence in teaching, research, service, but we also aspire to link the secular reason and resources of this university with the moral and spiritual framework of the, that the Baha'i Chair offers. Now, I just have to interrupt my words to say one very, very practical thing. You may get a ticket if you park in the wrong place. And I want you to know that if you look at the ticket, there is a place normally, if it's the first time you've got a ticket, where you can you can just check it and then you don't get a ticket. But if you do get a ticket, please will you let me have it in almost all circumstances unless you're parked uh, uh, crossways across three uh, handicapped <laughs> parking spaces. I can fix tickets. That's one of, that, that is one of the few privileges that, 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 that a dean has, is to be, able, to be able to fix tickets. So I want you to have a very in, 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 enjoy, enjoyable t time here. Uh, we're, we really are honoured by your presence here and I'm looking forward to a, a, a very enlightening talk. <coughs> Achieving peace is really, really tough. It's very, very difficult. We all need a passion for peace. It is not enough to be, to wait for peace and just to always use gentle words, though we should never use angry words. But we need this passion for peace. And I think in Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi, we have someone with a genuine passion for peace, with the ability to make a huge change to the university, to the nation, and to the, and to, and to the world. Finally, I was extremely disappointed in this audience when the first holder of the peace chair was mentioned, because when Dr. Sahil Bashrui is mentioned as the first holder of the peace chair, he never gets anything less than a standing ovation. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm, sh I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful lecture, and I think I now pass back to you, Hona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Townsend. Our second distinguished speaker is Mr. Kenneth Bowers. Mr. Bowers has served since 2007 as the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. Since the inception of the Baha'i Chair, some 20 years ago, the National Spiritual Assembly has been a source of constant support and wise counsel to the holders of the Baha'i Chair and to the University of Maryland's leadership. In addition to this significant role, the generosity of the National Spiritual Assembly 
continues to ensure the financial security of the Baha'i Chair. Mr. Kenneth Bowers is the National Spiritual Assembly's liaison to the advisory board of the Baha'i Chair. And in this way, I cannot say enough about how much he supports. His, it's a steadfast support of the, of the Baha'i Chair and, and how much that means to the work of the chair and how much that has helped the work of the chair to progress. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, Mr. Kenneth Bowers. So my first question, John, can you fix any tickets or just those on campus? <laughs> oh, just on, okay, all right, never mind, because I teenage kids. That's all right, all right, no problem. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to speak to you this evening on behalf of the National Spiritual Assembly. The Baha'i Chair for World Peace, I would submit, was founded essentially on three premises. The first of them is the need for world peace, that is to say, the recognition that it is something that's very important to pursue. In our generation, the concept that all members of the human race are ultimately one family, the idea that we are all stewards of a common home, that the nations share essential interests, and that we are in the midst of a process leading to the creation of a global civilization in due course, finds general currency among leaders of thought throughout the world. But we can also see that the full implications of such an understanding have yet to be explored and still less to be applied in a world that is shaken by grave threats to its peace and security. The second premise is that peace is a subject worthy of academic study. There is an urgent need, though, to build such capacities as will promote peace, to ensure that prejudices of all kinds, together with their effects, whether religious, national or racial, are eliminated to guarantee everywhere the rights of women, to foster worldwide participation in the generation and dissemination of knowledge, to achieve effective demilitarization and the establishment of a sound system of international law, to meet the challenge of sustainable development, protecting the environment and assuring the equitable use of the world's resources, all these just to name a few. There is every reason then to assert that academia must be a key forum for the resolution of all of these complex questions. And the third premise, perhaps most importantly, is that peace is possible. However, as you heard from Professor Townsend, challenging as it is, the Baha'is are optimistic as to humanity's ultimate destiny. But the road to that destiny, we very well are aware, will be difficult and will depend upon the efforts of all people of vision and goodwill. For peace, after all, is not merely a state of repose and certainly less a state of complacency. Rather, peace is an act of will. Without the volition, understanding, and practical ability to translate the goal of peace into reality, without leaders who consciously connect policies and programs with universal values, we are left not with peace, but only with platitudes. For this reason, we are especially proud and pleased to have an association with the University of Maryland. This great institution has become a world-class leader in every branch of learning. It has, in innumerable ways, demonstrated in a profound commitment to the rigorous search for truth and has consciously adopted the goal of raising up generations of future leaders who will be guided in their life's work by such values as will render them able to make contributions to the betterment of the world. The Baha'i Chair's wide-ranging programs and activities are a source of pride to Baha'is the world over, as is our relationship with this justly renowned institution of higher learning that shares in our vision of global peace. So we look forward with confidence to the enhancement of the chair's considerable legacy, presently under the wise leadership of Dr. Hoda Mahmoudi, and with pleasure to strengthening the warm and productive relationship we have with this university. 
For more than two decades, the chair has benefited from the support and encouragement of many university faculty and administrators, and we have been deeply impressed by their vision, their collegiality, and their generosity of spirit. And there are too many of them to name here tonight, but I do wish to express special gratitude to Dean John Townsend for his extraordinary efforts over the past several years, and his services really have been indispensable in providing for the future of the chair's success. Friends, if you would please join me in thanking Dean Townsend for his services. And if you, if you don't mind coming forward, uh, there's one last thing I'd like to do, which is to offer a more tangible tribute <laughs> to our appreciation. The funds that are received by the National Spiritual Assembly come from voluntary contributions of members of the Baha'i faith throughout the country, and they are held by the National Assembly as a sacred trust on the understanding that they will be expended only on activities that truly are worthy of our vision for a peaceful world. So with this in mind, I'm happy now to offer a contribution on behalf of the Baha'is of the United States to the Baha'i Chair for World Peace in the amount of $100,000. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything. Keep it up, It just makes a huge difference to our lives at the University of Maryland when we have support from such wonderful people for such wonderful purposes. Thank you. You inspire us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowers. Is peace gendered? Tonight's presentation will be delivered in a few minutes by Professor Sharon Halevi. The title addresses a paramount social issue that is at the core of any discussion about global peace, namely the relationship between peace and the achievement of full equality between men and women. The founding of the Baha'i Chair in 1993, which was inspired by the values and principles proposed in the statement of the Universal House of Justice, which is the International Council of the Baha'i Faith, entitled The Promise of World Peace, in this document, the achievement of the complete equality between women and men is not only addressed, but is considered as one of the most important, though less acknowledged, prerequisites of global peace. The document states that there are no grounds, moral, practical, or biological, upon which the denial of full equality for, when, for women can be justified. To address the complexity that surrounds this vital matter and to expand our knowledge about the subject, I cannot think of a more erudite speaker to call upon than Professor Sharon Halevi. Professor Halevi is a historian and the director of the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Haifa in Israel. She received her PhD from the University of Iowa in 1995. She is a founding member and a board member of the Israel Association of Feminist and Gender Studies and was the founder and board member of a business of her own a project for the economic empowerment of women utilizing the macro enterprise strategy. Among Professor Halevi's research interests are history of identities, personal, political, and ethnic, the relationship between women and the state, and the public and political role of wives 
She has published numerous articles about politics, gender, and the media, peace education, and about the impact of women's studies on Palestinian and Jewish women and students in Israel. Her current book project, Revolutionary Selves, examines the narrative articulations of personal identity in autobiographies in the early American Republic. Professor Halevi has written and edited a number of books and numerous articles, too many to mention here. Her scholarly works, however, have covered such, such topics as the emergence of Inuit ethnic identity in Canada, the early Arabic novel as a social compass, gendering culture in greater Syria, intellectuals and ideology in the late Ottoman Empire, utopias and dystopias, vision, fiction, and politics, and the other daughters of the revolution toward the hidden transcript of gender in, er, in the early republic. So you see how broad her interests are and how amazing her scholarly works are. Ladies and gentlemen, to present tonight's lecture, Is Peace Gendered? Please join me in welcoming the 2013 annual lecturer of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, Professor Sharon Halevi. got my instructions. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Dean Townsend, Mr. Kenneth Bowers, members of the National Spiritual Assembly, donors and supporters of the work of the Baha'i Chair, faculty, students, and guests, thank you very much and welcome. I would like to thank my colleague and friend, Professor Hoda Mahmoudi, for inviting me to deliver this lecture and for giving me the opportunity to present my thoughts on this topic before such a distinguished audience. In many ways, delivering this lecture here today is my way of repaying a long-standing debt, a debt many of you had no idea that you were owed. But as any long-term resident of Haifa would tell you, the Baha'is hold a special place in the city's heart. Um, the Baha'i Shrine of the Bab has become our unofficial symbol. It is the iconic image of the city view. It is the place many of us went as children for weekend strolls with our parents. It is where we take our out-of-town guests. And on any day of the week, you will find young couples posing for their wedding pictures in the gardens. <laughs> The serenity and beauty of the gardens have, I believe, played a significant role in forming the collective psyche of Haifa, a place that is slightly different, a saner, abnormally normal place, although I use that term with caution in my neck of the neighborhood, um, a harbinger of, white, of what might yet come to be. Um, and on a lighter note, um, if this is not enough, I thank you in the name of all the residents of Haifa for giving our mayor a serious case of flower envy. There is, not, there is not a single traffic roundabout in the city that has not been covered in shrubs and flowers. We strongly suspect because of your influence. Uh, and once again, leaving our out-of-town visitors you know, shaking their heads at yet another a symptom of the zaniness of Haifa and its residents. So, thank you very much. So, to get to the matter at hand, is peace gendered? In many ways, the answer to this seems quite obvious. Of course, peace is gendered. Any human activity, be it making peace, waging war, running, or eating, is gendered. The activity has a different impact on men and women, 
it holds different social meanings for them, and its consequences in the future differ as well. However, the term gendered also, also points to a more profound patterning. As feminist sociologist Joan Acker puts it, to say that on an organization or any other analytic unit is gendered means that advantages and disadvantages, exploitation and control, action and emotion, meaning and identity are patterned through and in terms of a distinction between male and female, masculine and feminine. Gender is not an addition to ongoing processes conceived as gender neutral. Rather, it is an integral part of these processes, which cannot be properly understood without an analysis of gender. After both teaching classes and speaking on a variety of issues and activities concerning peace and women for the last several years, I came to understand the immense impact of this configuration. I realized that while most people conceded that both waging war and making peace were gendered activities shared by and having an impact on men and women alike, although in, many diff in very different ways, they still persisted at a much um, deeper cultural level a vague conceptual equation. War equals men, peace equals women. Thus, despite the growing participation and visibility of women in the armed forces worldwide, despite impressive strides in global efforts to ensure women's involvement in policy making at all levels and in the arena of international diplomacy, and in the face of decades of new, highly nuanced feminist work on the subject of war and conflict and peace, contemplating issues concerning gender and peace resurrected all the old notions regarding peace, femininity, and motherhood. But of course women are more peaceful, I was told. Women give life, they don't take it. If women only ran the world, audience members mused wistfully. I must admit, in moments of extreme frustration, I began to wonder if there was a good reason why beauty pageant contestants reconstructing hyper-feminized performances seemed to answer every second question with world peace. <laughs> While the simplicity of this equation is appealing, the reasoning upon which it rests is built upon certain assumptions about the nature of men and women. It was this persistent way of thinking about peace, both peace as a concept and the pursuit of peace as an activity, an outlook which gender codes, uh, coded peace as feminine, which made me consider if perhaps this may be one of the hurdles in thinking more clearly about peace and how we pursue it. In this lecture, I would like to explore three issues. First, what are the political and organizational drawbacks of war, peace, becoming binary or opposed gendered issues? How does this obstruct our ability to make sense of war and peace as socio-historical phenomenon and hamper our ability to solve and or um, excuse me, achieve them? I will demonstrate these shortcomings through an examination of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. Second, I suggest how moving towards a positive peace enables us to move out of this binary conceptualization. And last, I turn my attention to a host of undertakings and activities that we as citizens should participate in and promote so as to ensure that peace and peacemaking do not remain the sole preserve of professional politicians and diplomats. My talk today is informed by the work and insights of scholars and researchers working in the field of feminist security theory or feminist security studies. Feminist security theory has sought to expose how the underlying ideological basis of patriarchy and militarism produce vulnerabilities among gendered individuals in a particular society. A feminist approach to the study and practice of peace challenges the notion that world peace is an unattainable ideal and offers important insights into the possible paths we may take in our human quest for peace. I, I also, as I shall elaborate later, 
take an anti-essentialist feminist approach to the study of peace and its binary twin war. Thus, while I do not, while I do want us to focus upon and discuss a host of issues pertaining to gender in general and women in particular during war, during the peace building period and in the construction of peace, I do not want to do this by reifying the differences between men and women. Thus, I intend to treat gender as an embedded social location, not as a descriptive variable. So, what is peace? Is it the flip side of war or the default option of all human societies? In order to think more clearly about building peace, it is important first to recognize the prevalence of violence in all forms and at all levels of society, as well as to be aware of our unspoken gendered assumptions regarding violence and its use. Second, we need to identify the conditions that cause war, transform them, and simultaneously develop more effective ways of resolving dispute without violence. And last, we have to understand the complex nature of peace. We should appreciate, as Betty Reardon puts it, that peace is the sum of the relationships of a multiplicity of global problems. The kind of peace people today most often identify as peace, with a capital P, is termed negative peace in peace research terminology. Negative peace simply denotes the absence of war. Most human endeavor in striving for peace and most of the research on the topic has focused on this kind of peace. Diplomacy, negotiations and treaties, disarmament and arms control, the formation of international cooperation and law, um, and peace movements. But this kind of peace can be very deceptive. The well-known 200-year peace of the Pax Romana, which was from uh, 27 BCE to 180 BCE, is the best known case of negative peace. This so-called peace was created and maintained through the political, social, and legal repression of those who lived under the Roman rule and was enforced by the military might of the Roman legions. While peace requires, at the very least, the cessation of the use of open and organized physical violence, peace does not mean the absence of conflict, as conflict is intrinsic to human relationships. The challenge is to devise ways to resolve group, national, or international differences without resorting to physical violence. Evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker claims that in this issue at least we may feel some optimism. Pinker argues that over the course of the last millennium there has been a significant decline in human violence. Nevertheless, we must also bear in mind that war the most open and direct form of organized violence, which is readily apparent through physical destruction and bodily injury, is not the only form of violence around. There is an indirect and far more insidious form of violence, structural violence. Structural violence is built into the very fabric of human society. It occurs when a society denies its members basic rights, social, political, economic, and sexual equality, when it undermines their well-being and their sense of self-worth by denying them food and housing, basic education and health care, be it for their ethnicity, religion, gender, age, or whatever other reason. Mary Anglin argues that the practices of structural violence have brought about a violence that is normalized and accepted as part of the status quo but that is experienced as injustice and brutality at particular intersections of race, ethnicity, class, nationality, gender, and age. Studies have suggested that women are disproportionately targets of structural violence, and gender inequalities often lie at the heart of women's political, economic, social, and sexual vulnerability. By reducing these social inequalities and lessening the ensuing structural violence, a more meaningful peace can come into being. Positive peace, then, refers to a situation in which both open physical violence and the more insidious structural violence are eliminated or minimized. 
I shall return and speak about this positive piece in the second section of my lecture, but I hope that you can already notice how working towards a positive piece meshes with many of the goals of a feminist movement and the reasons why many, who view, many view the goals of the two movements as compatible. But let us return for a moment to my opening argument that war and peace are often treated as binary or opposed gendered issues with men and women having different vested interests in them. I strongly believe we need to appreciate the fact that under the current gender system, if we as a society have inadvertently or not feminized peace or gender coded the pursuit of peace as a feminine activity, there is a price tag attached to this coding. As Rachel Einwarner, Jocelyn Hollander, and Tosca Olson should suggest, when particular images of gender become attached to movements, they evoke a particular framing of the issue at hand. Okay? Um, yeah. This framing both implies a way of understanding the issues and designates certain actors as legitimate actors in the issue arena. While activists and members of a movement, any social or political movement for that matter, may wish to use gender to, frame, to favorably frame a particular issue or to claim legitimacy as political actors, gender can also be used against them in order to delegitimize them. Thus, this kind of gender coding or gender framing is problematic, as studies have demonstrated that social movements that draw upon feminine stereotypes face a double bind that helps the movement in the short run, but hampers their chances of success in the long run. As I see it, this was very much the case of women, the idea of peace in general, and the peace movement in particular. In the late 19th, but particularly in the early 20th century, when women in Western Europe and North America did not have suffrage rights, or if they had those rights, women were not yet recognized universally as political actors. Claiming the right to speak out as women, and particularly as mothers, on a variety of political issues ranging from municipal housekeeping to global issues of war and peace was a logical and brilliant political tactic. It legitimized a voice that would have been ignored and, and enabled women to stake their claims to full and equal participation in the public sphere. What I would like us to consider is, is this tactic still useful to us, women and men alike, in the pursuit of peace today. While most contemporary feminist theorists reject such biologically deterministic views of femininity altogether, some feminists in the 1970s and 1980s who drew upon 19th and early 20th century feminist traditions contended that differences in gender socialization, particularly in early childhood, and life experiences in general render women more peaceful than men. In her pathbreaking work, Maternal Thinking, feminist philosopher Sarah Ruddick presents a philosophical analysis of mothering as a social practice and tries to demonstrate how it may serve as a basis for a feminist politics of peace. Ruddick argues that there is a peacefulness latent in maternal practice and suggests that maternal thinking could make a unique contribution to peace politics. <laughs> the aims and goals of a mother consist of the preservation of one's children, fostering their growth and tending to their social training. In order to treat children well on good days and bad, mothers must cultivate qualities of virtues such as self-scrutiny, the ability to see things and oneself in perspective, humility and cheerfulness. In order to foster a child's growth, one cannot impose an ideal life script on the child. Rather, one learns and teaches the child how to fulfill his or her full potential to be a better person despite one's weaknesses. A conscientious mother not only socializes her children to be law-abiding citizens, but also teaches them that there are times they must critically question, doubt, and even disobey rules, society's rules and norms. Ruddick's ultimate hope was to introduce this maternal thinking into the world of public affairs. For example, Ruddick argues that people who engage in maternal thinking are more likely to consider the concrete 
rather than abstract implications of war. For maternal thinkers, war is not about making sure that one's nation comes out on top no matter what. Rather, thinking about war means weighing between abstract, an abstract political goal and risking the life of a child whom one has spent years preserving, nurturing, and training. Thus, for Ruddick, those doing maternal work have clear motives for rejecting war, distinct abilities for resolving conflict, as well as a unique perspective from which to criticize military thinking. Ruddick's thesis, thought-provoking and appealing as it may be, was challenged quite early on. Scholars pointed out that while Ruddick recognizes the great social, geographical, and historical diversity of mothering, this diversity is eclipsed in her quest for a un universal form of maternal thinking. Since the early 1980s, feminist scholars have also been questioning the characterization of men as warriors and women as peacemakers, and have considered the social and political consequences of this portrayal. Jean Beth K. Elstein, for example, has argued that women's claim to a natural or cultural superiority in matters of peace only reinscribe gender dichotomies and hierarchies, while Judith Stein contends that women's protected status places them in a position of dependency on men for security. Feminist scholars have also pointed out that motherhood or maternalism has often been used in nationalist discourses. The image of the patriotic mother who produces children or soldiers for the nation, or the Spartan mother who raises her sons as warriors and willingly sacrifices them for the greater good are two of the more well-known uh, of such examples. Studies have demonstrated that women are more than capable of constructing identities, including the identity as mothers, in ways that are not conducive to peace, and that they have cast their electoral votes to oppose peacemaking. In fact, medical anthropologist Nancy Shepard Hughes has argued that in certain cases, there exists a maternal ethos of acceptable death an ethos which enables political violence and war. She finds that certain aspects of the experience of mothering can instruct and permit women under certain conditions of scarcity, famine, oppression, and political disruption to surrender their sons and husbands to violence, war, and even death. In contemporary political affairs, the identification of women with motherhood has provided some women for a basis from which to appeal to men as, and has enabled their access to a limited number of public roles in post-conflict societies. However, as scholars have pointed out, there is another side to the linkage of women in peace, an association that relies on essentialist notions of masculinity and femininity, a linkage which conflates gender with sex and one with intentionally or not ultimately serves to keep women in their place and em ameliorates the worst aspects of patriarchy. I would like to offer two brief examples, one from Israel and the other from Mexico, to support my argument concerning the dis or disadvantages or advantages of this maternal rhetoric. Uh, over the last several decades in Israel, as Israeli women began to make inroads into public life, the dilemma remained in which voice they would choose to speak, that of the citizen or that of the mother. Overwhelmingly, the choice has been to speak in the voice of the mother, and more significantly, in the voice of the soldier's mother. One of the most influential of these women's protest groups was Four Mothers, which uh, was active between 1997 and 2000, which called for you Israel's unilateral withdrawal from its self-proclaimed security zone in southern Lebanon. While four mothers did succeed in gathering a significant and diverse group of supporters, and it succeeded in establishing the legitimacy of maternal resistance in the Israeli public in general, which has unfortunately been sometimes indifferent and even hostile to other peace movements, it never articulated a feminist or anti-militaristic ideology nor did it, did it choose to speak from the position of a citizen. By insisting on speaking as mothers, 
even if defiant, members of the movement both accepted and reinforced the prevailing Israeli discourse of gendered citizenship, in which men fulfill their civic duties by becoming soldiers and women by becoming mothers. And I must say this, this, this is despite the fact that this movement was very much responsible for Israel's final withdrawal from this security zone. The other example is from Mexico. In her study of the anti-femicide movement in northern Mexico over a decade between 1995 and 2000, Melissa Wright attended to the shortcomings excuse me, of the mother activism as a political strategy. She describes how by emphasizing mother activism on the one hand and by rhetorically delegitimizing and marginalizing activists who are non-family members of the victims on the other, the state was able to neutralize a wide-ranging coalition of activists who had linked their activism, activism to broader critiques concerning domestic violence and the patriarchal family. Since the 1980s, feminist scholars who studied the work uh, or the issue of women and the use of violence have con constantly reminded and recommended that we abandon any notion that women are innately less violent or more peaceful than men, be it in the political realm, in wartime and wartime violence, or within domestic settings. Now, this literature was not written, nor do I cite it, in order to prove that women are capable of being just as violent as men, because statistically, they are not. Nor to deny the violence inflicted on women during war, or is it intended to disparage the impressive and courageous work done by women participating in peace movement. Rather, it was written in order to disrupt this gender binary and undermine the pervasive gender hierarchy by resisting attempts to give undue prominence to one particular gender, even if this is done by inverting the hierarchy, placing women on top, or placing women's values on top. As, sorry. One, sorry, this is going. This is her. As Laura Kaplan so aptly puts it, a feminist peace theory begins by questioning the categories of masculinity and femininity rather than by formulating solutions within this dichotomous worldview. The building of a negative peace consists of both formal and informal activities. While women are visible in the informal activities, in peace movements, in protests, in dialogue groups, and so forth. In some cases, even constituting the majority of the participants in these movements. Until recently, they have been noticeably absent from the formal activities, diplomacy, peace negotiations, disarmament talks, and so forth. Women's traditional exclusion from these formal activities was usually carried out under the pretext that they were not leaders, decision makers, or combatants. Thus, their past exclusion from these positions became the rationale for their present and future ex exclusion. Over the last 20 years, two trends have evolved simultaneously. On the one hand, a body of highly nuanced scholarship concerning issues of gender, conflict resolution, and peace within both national and international settings emerged. Feminist scholars from all disciplines have played a crucial role in this body of work, insisting that scholars and policymakers alike take into account the role of women as historical actors in war and peace on, on, on one hand, and integrate gender as an analytical category on the other. This scholarship had an important role in informing and supporting the growing worldwide women's rights advocacy, both within and outside feminist movements and peace movements, which insisted on demanding the greater involvement of women in international decision and policy making, and on paying greater attention to the differential impact of war making and peace building on men and women. Together, they have succeeded in creating a sea change in the realm of global policy making. The high watermark of this decade of international, transnational women's activity aimed at mainstreaming a host of issues pertaining to women within 
the United Nations, was reached on October 2000, uh, sorry, 31st of October 2000, when the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1325 on women's, women, peace, and security. Together with the resolutions that followed, and I'll just mention them, Resolution 1820, 2106 and 2122, Resolution 1325 has become a major component in the UN's efforts to build peace and security by taking into account the needs and voices of women. Resolution 1325 called upon con all countries first to allow increased representation for women at all decision-making levels of conflict resolution and peacemaking as well as granting them a larger role in peacekeeping operations. Second, it insisted that all parties involved in negotiating and implementing peace agreements have to take into account the special needs of women and girls and implement international human rights law that respects women's rights. Third, it urges that parties to an armed conflict take measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence such as rape and other forms of sexual violence, and emphasize the responsibility of all countries to prosecute those responsible for crimes against women and girls. Last, it insisted that in the post-conflict period, countries need to take into account the differing needs of female and male ex-combatants. However, these resolutions, valuable and significant as they are, still rely upon that same binary gender logic discussed earlier. These resolutions single out sexual violence during conflict periods, setting them apart from ongoing forms of violence against women before, during, and after these periods. More importantly, they do not contextualize this violence within the framework of an analysis of gendered social, political, and economic inequalities that shape women's vulnerability to violence in the first place. Thus, intentionally or not, they reinforce an essentialist view of men as the perpetrators of violence and women as victims in need of male protection. Nadine Pueshguribal, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, who has studied and analyzed the language of these resolutions demonstrates that the language, not only, uh, the language used not only denies women's agency and constructs them as victims, but constantly uses gender as a synonym for women. Basically, men don't have a gender. Thereby reducing the potential of these resolutions to degender peace. The term and perspective of gender has been co-opted and is condensed into almost a form of politically correct lip service which is satisfied with tokenism rather than with real change. These resolutions and many other documents pertaining to human rights also suffer from the women and children syndrome, which Cynthia Enlow has not very humor humorously termed women and children. She writes it as, as one word squished in together. Women are defined primarily as mothers and always linked to children a characterization which I have argued homogenizes and essentializes them. As only one component of women's identity, their sex or gender, is relevant in this configuration, all other identities, class, ethnicity, religion, sexual identity, age, which may inflect their approach or views are subsumed under women. As a result, the presence of women at the negotiating table is reduced to a mere headcount. Few questions, if any, are raised as to who are the women representing women. Are they elite or privileged women, however privilege is defined in a particular society? Are they sensitive to feminist concern, concerns or are they feminists themselves? Uh, do they consider or are they even conscious of women's needs? Are they consulted and do they participate in the discussions on all issues or only on those pertaining to sexual violence? What role do women have in peacekeeping forces? Some scholars fear that because women are reduced to their experiences of victimization, this may obviate the need to consult and defer to them on broader issues of peace building. 
Another issue pertains to the implementation of these resolutions. For better or for worse, wars are also times when conventional gender rules and norms break down. Thus, the post-conflict con reconstruction may offer a unique opportunity to legally and constitutionally safeguard gender equity and protect the economic and social gains made by women. However, fearing that its insistence on the inclusion of gender equity into the post-conflict agreements and accords may derail the fragile peace negotiations or settlements, the international community has not always persevered its in, in its insistence that these, um, these, these issues be included in the peace agreement. While in the resolutions following UN Security Council Resolution 1325, there has been a sincere attempt to address these issues and correct them. A closer attention to the binary way in which men and women were configured may have enabled these pitfalls to be avoided in the first place. I hope that by now it is clear why I believe, first, that this association of peace or war with one particular gender is not con uh, conducive to furthering the cause of peace. Second, that peace requires far more than just the cessation of violence and hostilities, although admittedly in many cases it would be a much needed first step. Feminist anthropologist Carolyn Nordstrom, a scholar of and, um, and eyewitness to worldwide rural and urban warfare has stated, peace does not equate to peace accord. Peace accords are political and military documents. They do not rectify collapsed institutions, nor call the violence embedded in society. If people are war traumatized, so are the institutions they populate. Peace is more than an end to violence. It is a freedom from oppression, fear, and misery born of political bloodshed. Laura so sorry, Sjoberg reiterates this statement. Peace is not something that can be declared, she says, but something that must be built. Indeed, over the last century, the meaning of peace has broadened to, uh, to uh, encompass a broader spectrum of issues, such as civil and human rights, global poverty, human trafficking, um, the development, development and the environment and gender equities. These issues, which manifest themselves as problems or violations in different ways in different places, are products of what Benedict Anderson terms the new world disorder and are often the causes of new conflicts. So unless we turn our attention to them and resolve or at least minimize them, conflicts between groups of people or states are going to continue. It is here, in the building of peace, as opposed to the declaring of peace, that we, as ordinary human beings and citizens, come into play, and our gender matters far less than our readiness to lend a hand. We cannot shy away from our responsibility, perhaps even necessity, of taking up our share of the burden of peace building. While some of the peace building, peace building is made up of issues, treaties, and resolutions that may only be dealt with or agreed upon on the international level, there are numerous other aspects that can be addressed on a national or state level, others that can be only dealt with on a civic and personal level, while yet others are complementary and require dealings on all levels simultaneously. I would like to provide just a few examples from each case and suggestions for um, how each of us could contribute towards the building of peace. Oops, ran too far. Here it is. On an international level, in the active pursuit of peace, it is very important not only to contain or resolve ongoing conflict, it is vital to keep a close watch for possible sources of future discord and attempt to diffuse them before they come in, become full-fledged conflicts. We need to bear in mind that the root causes of these potential conflicts may be significantly different from those current um, ethno-national or ethno-religious conflicts that have so dominated the 19th and 20th centuries. 
scholars have suggested that, in, that the likelihood of conflicts surrounding environmental and natural resources are likely to increase in recent years. I'll take as an example one such currently brewing conflict. In May two, uh, 2013, Ethiopia began diverting the Blue Nile River in order to com uh, complete the construction of its Grand Renaissance Dam, which began in April 2011. This $4.2 billion dam, scheduled to be completed in July 2017, is aimed at generating some 6,000 megawatts at maximum capacity, mainly in order to export electricity to its neighboring countries. But before beginning to divert the diversion of the Blue Nile, Ethiopia's parliament had to ratify a controversial treaty ensuring its access to the Nile River water. We, this treaty replaced a 1929 colonial era agreement, which was re-ratified in um, 1959, that granted Egypt and the Sudan the majority of water rights, about 90% to be exact, without giving the other countries any consideration. And um, Egypt and the Sudan also um, received veto power over other countries' projects. The new treaty allows upstream countries to implement irrigation and hydro, hydropower projects without first seeking Egypt's approval, as some of 96% of the Nile waters flowing into Egypt originate in the Blue Nile out of Ethiopia. Egypt views the construction of this dam as a serious security concern, which may have to be dealt with by the use of military force. I'm saying again, this is about water for drinking, water for irrigation, and water for electricity. It's quietly brewing there. Nobody's paying attention. Well, I can't say nobody. Journalists are paying attention to it, but it kind of appears on page seven. The second issue. Nations, even those not contemplating going to war the next day, devote considerable time preparing for war. Plans are made, reserves are trained, air raids Air raid drills are held. Civilians are asked to store basic supplies. All this goes towards mental preparation of one's citizenry. Can you think of an equivalent preparation before signing a peace treaty? There seems to be a tacit assumption that peace will break out and everything will be fine. But scholars have found that the period immediately before and following the signing of a peace treaty is the most vulnerable and risky stage of the priest process, when the scale and intensity of violence and terrorism may actually increase rather than decrease. The purpose of this violence is not to um, gain any direct military gains or to express disagreements. We know about the disagreements. But rather, it is intended to sow doubt and distrust among moderates on both sides especially on the targeted side, whichever side is targeted. This behavior of spoilers, or spoiling, that's how it's, it's called, during periods of conflict resolution, while a well-known phenomenon to scholars, is rarely, if ever, explained to ordinary citizens. While I do think it is a government's duty to explain a peace-building process to its citizen, if it neglects to do so, we must educate ourselves about peace. We must understand how conflicts arise and come into being, and how to end them, and how peace works. If we keep on thinking about peace as an absence, or as simply as the cessation of war, then we are going to keep being disappointed at our inability to achieve peace. Understanding the behaviors of spoilers or spoiling makes it just as important for us to support official efforts at peacemaking and peace building by expressing our support for the peace process. One way we may build the support is by making peace a sustainable reality through the process that has come to be known as second track or citizens diplomacy. Unofficial facilitated face-to-face -face dialogue which permits communication, understanding, and rehumanization of the enemy, relationship building, and reframing the conflict as a shared problem to be solved rather than a battle to be won or lost. Problem-solving workshops, dialogue groups have 
proved to be immensely valuable and effective. One may also decide that the best way to pursue peace is to deal with some of the social inequalities that lead to conflict or lead to the view that the use of force is the best way to resolve conflict. For example, studies have shown that there's a high correlation between higher levels of gender equity within a state and lower levels of the use of military actions to settle international disputes. Perhaps working towards reducing such inequality is your way of joining the work of peace building. Peace building also has an emotional aspect to it. Letting go of the past, of past hurts, of the desire for revenge, and even reconceptualizing one's connection between personal or group identity and a past injury is a very difficult task, but one that has to be dealt with if true reconciliation is to be achieved. A state may sign a peace treaty with another, but if either state's citizens continue to harbor anger, resentment, and bitterness, this will be a very hollow peace. Now let me be clear here. I'm not arguing that we forget the past in general or past injuries in particular, but we must learn from the past, not only remember it. While we should never negate the experiences of victims, we must cease to focus exclusively on victimhood. In some cases, in some countries, truth and reconciliation committees have proven to be a valuable place to resolve such issues. In others, former, formal apologies or reparations. In others, a far more private, perhaps even therapeutic confrontation with those emotions needs to take place by victims and their families, or even by ordinary citizens who may have not suffered physically but have come to be embittered and disillusioned over years of conflict. While different mechanisms for the process of reconciliation will be of use in different conflicts, this process has to take place. And we as citizens have an important role to play, even if only in recognizing the value and enabling it to take place. Peace building is a daunting undertaking in the best of times. It requires a steadfast commitment to stay the course of reconciliation in the face of enormous pressures to go back to the way things were and or to exact greater concessions or apologies from the other side. No state or no government, however well-intentioned, can do this daily, routine, unglamorous, face-to-face -face, face -face work of making peace a reality. And so far, the majority of us have been quite content to sit back, enjoy, and criticize, criticize the work done or not done, done by our government. Since I started with a story about a garden, I think I would like to end with a story of another garden. The Midrash tells us the story of the Emperor Hadrian, who was strolling on the outskirts of the city of Tiberias when he came across a very old man who was planting some fig trees. The emperor mocked the old man and said, if you had worked in your early years, old man, you would not have to work so late in your life. I have worked both early and late, the old man answered, and what pleases the Lord, he has done with me. How old are you? asked Hadrian. A hundred years old, the man answered. A hundred years old, and yet you stand here breaking up the soil to plant trees? Do you expect to eat the fruit of these trees? If I am worthy, I will eat, said the old man. But if not, as my forefathers planted for me, I plant for my children. The biblical injunction demands of us not only to seek peace, but to pursue it. And pursue it we must, even though it sometimes seems an exercise in futility, and we fear we may never catch up with it in our lifetime. But if I may add my two cents to these words, when in the pursuit of peace, don't prepare for a sprint. You have just signed on for a marathon. Thank you.
Professor Halevi, I don't know how to thank you for that most illuminating, brilliant, well thought out lecture, which really lays out a major work for all of us, which is that how do we, each of us, begin to carry out what she has uh, charted out in her marvelous presentation. Thank you so much again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for forcing me to think about it. We would like to now entertain some questions, if that's okay. And if you would come up here and come, back a, the come, come up. And you have these note cards in your um, programs. And I would like to ask you to please write down your questions. and. Uh, there are ushers on either aisle that will come down and pick them up and bring them forward. We will probably not be able to entertain all of them, but as that is happening, I'm going to ask the first question, with your permission. Um, I would like your comments about why it is important for us to guard against the temptation of marginalizing women as different. I'm not arguing against difference. Difference is good. Um, but sometimes we tend to understand difference not this way, but this way. Mm -hmm. And when we, we think of women as different, somehow this has been interpreted over millennia millenniums practically, as women being something less than human, um, something closer to property, something closer to animal, something closer to nature, uh, but not fully human. Um, I think that the most basic demand of feminism is the acceptance, the consideration, the treatment of women as full-fledged human beings with all the rights and duties that go with being a human being. And then let's talk about the difference. So that's what I'm worried about. Thank you. I will ask a second question. You mentioned that a feminist approach to the study and practice of peace challenges the notion that world peace is unattainable and also suggests possible paths towards that uh, paths forward. Could you please elaborate on this idea? Sure. The intention is not to um, eradicate conflict or eradicate violence. That, at some level, I guess, would, would still exist. But um, can I have that card? I, I want to Absolutely. refer to one word again, if you, you, you use there. Um, but if you break peace down into smaller problems, into smaller problems that, that might be very large problems, but you break it down, and people feel that they can respond, they can contribute, they can add to that, rather than just standing in a, in a, in a demonstration, which some of us don't like exactly doing that thing, it becomes much more of a reality. Because peace can also be uh, setting up a reading group in your neighborhood. And um, there's a lot of research done recently about the reading of fiction and the creation of empathy. Um, so that could be your work for peace. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it is a grand scale, but you're working at a grand scale, but on a, small, on a small, smaller level. It can be a whole range of things. Um, it can be, um, work in, in about violence in ch with children in, in schools, um, violence against women. It can be a whole range of issues concerning the growth of poverty, um, not just the feminization of poverty, but poverty spreading towards new groups. Um, there's a gradual, mainly in, in other countries, there's a gradual um, erosion of the middle class, which many people fear is a, another future source of instability. Um, how do we work on all these things? So if you break it down into smaller components, if you see peace as, as, a, as a very holistic approach, then I think you, it's easier to deal with it. And then it becomes more real, because you're dealing on all levels simultaneously 
and then hopefully one day we'll wake up in the morning and peace will be here. From the audience, from the audience, what steps can be taken to overcome gender norms in societies that place harsh restrictions on women? Hmm. Well, the easy answer would be grant them equality. <laughs> That's much more difficult to do in practice than it is to say it. Um, I don't know, I'm still working at it. I, I haven't figured out. I mean, I, I really think that that's problematic because even in societies where legal equality has been achieved, there are underlying norms that's, that we, you know, they're hiding out there all along. So I'm not sure I can tell you that legal equality is, is going to solve this problem, but I think maybe it might be a useful first step because it at least indicates um, a sense of, people, the state saying this is wrong, at least coming out and saying this form of inequality is wrong. We will not tolerate it, even if it's only on the level of speech. Uh, I think that's an important first step. I think then you have to start working on all the other steps and not sit quietly. But um, it's, it's difficult because if this is a society that places very harsh restrictions on women, this is not a society that's usually going to take a very positive view of a democratic process. So maybe working towards peace and working towards gender equality also means moving towards a more democratic form of government. These are all interlaced questions that you can't solve one without solving the other and you can't solve all without solving Are you okay? Sure. Keep going. Okay. Would the peace process require balance of both the masculine and feminine, or should there be an emphasis on the feminine? Hmm. I think in the short run there has to be an emphasis on the fem on the feminine because it is true that the majority of the um, Civilian, civilian casualties or civilian victims of war and wartime violence are women. But I think you cannot disregard that violence is also directed towards men. Actually, most of the people who are killed during a war are male, whether they are soldiers or civilians. So it is, it is wrong to look only at, the, at, at women. Um, the next issue has, uh, to do also with what happens to combatants after war. You see, while, while civilian women are, there's a lot of focus attended to them, when it comes to combatants, suddenly the attention switches to male combatants. There's almost no attention devoted to women who were combatants during the war, whether formal soldiers, guerrillas, terrorists, whatever. Um, there's very little attention to them. They're somehow expected to reintegrate, blend back in into their societies, and they have been um, in a very difficult position of being, of being both victims and victimizers, which kind of makes it more complicated to deal with them. So I think that in the short run, yes, there has to be attention on women, but I think in the long run, you have to understand that this has to be treating both of them in the same way. But I, I like that question. Sorry. Yes. Next question, how can we have peace if we refuse to forgive the past? Working on that one. <laughs> Maybe I use forgiveness in a different way. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget. Uh, forgiveness can only occur if, if, if someone actually comes and says, I'm sorry, and then it is your duty. To forgive. But I think perhaps what you may be asking about is how you let go of the past. Now, letting go of the past is, is a very difficult thing. I think, um, and I say this as someone who has to work on herself. I, um, I am known not only to hold grudges, but to hold them dear, nurse them into long life and good health. <laughs> so it is, it is very difficult 
um, to do it. I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about minor things. I'm not talking about major issues, heaven forbid. But it is the most difficult thing to do. It is the most difficult thing to do is to let go of the past because in very many cases that injury has become part of who we are. It has become a constituting element of who we are. And if we, have, we give up that hurt, if we give up that wrong that was done to us, and it was a wrong done to us, don't, don't misunderstand me, we at some point have to create a new, a new, a new I, a new me. And that is enormously, enormously difficult. Um, people have, have come up with a variety of solutions. Some have turned to therapy, some have turned to religion, some have turned to good works, to do things, you know, to do rather than to constantly focus, to do rather than um, to constantly say. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not working this out very well. But, but there have been... There have been several works to, uh, written about how to do this. I'm not sure if it can work, because if it worked so well, we would have all been there. Um, I think there are different solutions for different people. And unfortunately, I think we also need to recognize the fact that there are people who won't be able to move past this hurt. The problem is, how do we, um, how do we move past that moment without giving them the sense that we have forgotten, we have marginalized, we have, we have neglected that hurt, but on the other hand, we cannot let them all the time disrupt the peacemaking, because they do it for very, um, very, very real, justifiable re reasons, but on the other hand, um, I will talk from personal experience, uh, a very good um, school friend of mine I'm talking from my experience. I'm not neg neg negating anybody else's suffering. He lost his daughter in a bus bombing about 10 years ago. And ever since then, um, um, his, his wife and he separated over this issue. This, this child who died, instead of bringing them together, drove them apart because he was unable to forgive. It ba basically became his life's mission to... Um, see that whoever was responsible for this would be punished. And when I mean see whoever was responsible, not the bomber who died in the explosion, but in general, whoever broadly sent these people, this person would be held responsible and accountable. Uh, while his wife believed that there has to be forgiveness, even if that letting go and forgiveness, if you, you would call it, means um, allowing former terrorists to be released from prison, if that would further the goal of peace. Uh, and this, this is a very contentious issue, um, one in that, in this case, the family could not contain. Um, but um, these are two different approaches. Do we, do we let go and, and move on, or do we stay with it? And, and I can understand. I mean, I don't, don't ever want any of us to be in that position but I can understand his pain, his grief, his hurt. And he's not doing it because he's a bad man. He's doing it because he cannot move from that moment. Um, so I don't know. I really, I think that that's another great question. Thank you. Thank Just asking you. me questions that's I can't it. answer. I, <laughs> I think that's enough and you can continue with the questioning after we finish here tonight. Thank you so much. Professor Thank you very Hunter. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I keep the questions? Yes, you can. Thank you. And there are more. Oh, thank you. Why don't you just take Thank them? you. Thank you. I'd yes. like to keep Please, them. please. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank her one more time. <laughs>